Uh, don't you just love worship? As we were worshiping God, it just uh, reminded me of, I can't speak for the women at the women's camp, but I believe it's the same way. At the man's camp, for those of you men that have been there, uh, my dad, Jesse, Barajas, uh, Gilbert, there's a different type of atmosphere. When you're surrounded by so many men, and you just hear the voices just worshiping, and it's just, it just seems like all of Prescott can hear. And the hands are lifted, men are on their knees, tears are coming down. And I believe it's that way for the women too also. But there's just something about worship that's just, wow. Uh, Sian, if you want to get that video ready, I'll, I'll let you know when to play it. But I'm going to tell you a, a story, and this is a true story. The other story that I told during my sermons, I've got from uh, my good friend, uh, Pastor Caden Metcalf. And uh, right now, can you just uh, join with me in congratulating him? He just got married um, last week on Father's Day. He just got married. But uh, all the stories that he tells, it's, it's at Radiant Church. It's on YouTube. You guys should, should uh, look it up. It's, he's a good man. And, and Caden, when you watch this, uh, congratulations. And uh, I'll pray and continue that God will bless you and your wife. Um, so the story here is... Uh, Every Monday, I have Sunday Mondays off from work, and I take my daughters to school. They go to school in Palominas, so it's about a, a 10 to 15 minute drive from Bisbee. So we're driving, and it's about almost flu season. So when flu season starts coming, you know what that means, the flu shots start coming. It's, it's not a kid's favorite thing to hear that they're going to get the flu shot pretty soon. And my oldest daughter, Yvette, she hates shots. She'll fight the nurse and fight her mom, fight me, fight everybody so that she does not get it. She'll kick, she kicked the nurses and everything. But uh, we were driving <clears throat> and we were talking about flu shot and I told her, I'm never gonna lie to you. I'm gonna tell you when you're gonna get your shot because every time we go somewhere, am I gonna go to the doctors? No, I told you, I promise you. I'm gonna tell you when you're gonna get a shot. I'm not gonna lie to you. And she's like, well, I hate doctors. I hate nurses, I hate hospitals, I hate everything. I'm like, well, why? Because they're mean. I don't like them. And I was like, well, God provided doctors and he provided nurses to help us. No, I still hate them. And we kept going on and on until we got to the San Pedro River. She's like, Dad, I still hate them. Again, Yvette, God gave us doctors and nurses to help us. No, God can heal us. God can help us. So why do I need doctors? I don't need to go to a doctor. God can give me the flu shot. So it's like, as a parent, I think all of us have heard our kids say something so smart or ask something that you're like, man, I don't have a response for that. that that's true. Well, Yvette, that's true. But we still got to go to the doctor. And she's like, no, mm-mm. But um, you just got to love kids. So instead of me introducing the, what I'm going to be preaching about, I'm going to let these kids on the screen uh, let you know what I'm going to preach about. The story of the prodigal son is... A boy and his brother, he lived on his father's like farm. He went into his dad and he wanted, um, he, he just wanted his money. And his dad said no, cause like he was worried. But since he loved his son so much, he gave him the money. He spent all the money on parties and like snacks. And he was party. He like wasted all his money. He was poor. He like didn't have anything. He had no clothes, no money. He had nothing to eat. So he found a job working with pigs. He felt very sorry when he spent all the money, his friends betrayed him, and then he ended up sleeping with pigs and eating garbage. But how did he eat a metal garbage? Like, you know, cans? They didn't have metal back then. Oh, so never mind. <laughs> they only had like pizza boxes, I think. With have to nachos. And then one day he had the thought that maybe he can go back to his home and ask his father to forget, forgive him. He was scared to go back home because he thought his father was mad. His father should have been mad at him when he came, but his father was waiting for him for a long time. When his father saw him, he was like overjoyed. He thought his son was dead, but he was actually alive. 
the prodigal son, he came down on his knees and asked his father for forgiveness. The father just forgave him. He wasn't mad and all of that. He just went up to him and he hugged him very tight because he missed him and welcomed him home. And then the father drew a big welcome back party for the son. That's really kind of off the hook though. And, and then that was the end. Hey, you gotta love the, the kids' responses. Uh, we talked about this on, on our Wednesday Bible study with the youth. I asked all the youth if they knew the story of the, pro the last prodigal, the prodigal son, and their, their responses, they knew. Kids know this story, this, this, uh, this parable. So right now, if you wanna turn with me to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, that's where we're gonna be at uh, for this sermon. Before we start reading this, you know, the parables, Jesus used the parables for a spiritual lesson. Pharisees hated it, told a lot of them, and Pharisees were just mad that Jesus was talking to sinners, hanging out with them, and being with them. But again, I mean, it's like a hospital, you know, where do you go when you're sick? A hospital, the doctors hang out with sick people. Same thing with Jesus, he's, he's there to help the sick, the lost. But there's two things that I want to go through right here before we start reading about uh, this parable, the parable of the lost son, first a prodigal, the meaning a prodigal, it does not mean rebellious or lost, it means wasteful and extravagant, it refers to a person who is reckless and squanders their wealth. And the second thing here, I mean all of us have read this parable, parable of the prodigal son, so we think of it as a parent losing a child. So this parable wasn't told to encourage parents with rebellious kids. It was told by Jesus to the Pharisees to unpack the lavish love of God for sinners. So those are the two things that I wanted to get out of the way before we start reading this. So in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, and before we, we get started again, uh, yes, pray for Doug and pray for my parents and my family as they go on trips, and, uh, but also uh, keep uh, Yolanda in your guys' prayer. Yolanda uh, um, Altamirano, she just got out of surgery, so again, keep her in prayers and also brother Gilbert so we'll start here in Luke chapter 15 verses 11 through 32 uh, I'm reading out of the NIV version we're gonna go through the whole thing and we'll come back so this is Jesus speaking Jesus continued there was a man who had two sons the younger one said to his father father give me my share of the estate so he divided his property between them not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off, a distant, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I'm starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me, make me like one of your hired men. So he got up, and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put, on, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for my son is mine. For, for my son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants. He asked him, what, what was going on? Your brother has come? He replied, and your father has killed the fan calf because he has... He has him back safe and sound. The older brother became, became angry and refused to go in. 
So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But, then, but when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill a fan kept for him. My son, the father replied, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate and be glad because the brother of yours was dead and is alive. Again, he was lost and now he is found. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning. This morning, Lord, that you welcome us into your house, Father. We just, I just pray, Lord, that you just clear our minds and clear our hearts. Help us to focus only on you, Lord. And let us leave differently than what we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So kids are a wonderful thing, beautiful thing. You know, when I was preparing for this message, I think Pastor Barajas and Pastor P can, can tell you the same thing. But when I pray and pray and pray and see what the Lord wants me to pray about, well, we just had Mother's Day. And we just had Father's Day, so now we're going to talk a little bit about kids and a little bit about ourselves. But I was preparing this message. I write, type, write notes. Something would go right, so I'd go back, keep studying and studying and studying and studying. It seemed like I was trying to put a perfect message together, but it's never going to be perfect. But it's like I keep going back and back and back. It's never satisfying. The last three days always happens. I always end up staying up late. Staying up late and waking up even earlier in the mornings because I feel like I need to still work on my message, continue to work on it, continue to see what else can I do. Lord, is there anything else that I need to put into this? You know, the first time I was preaching, I would always put a stopwatch on, go in front of the mirror, and practice over and over and over again and see where my time was at. It's like I was so focused on myself and trying to get this message right and let it be me and not being led by the Spirit. But again, it's like, I can't get it perfect. So when we have our children, it's like we want to raise them perfectly, go on the right path. And as they grow older, it's like we have to let them go. Kids are a gift. They're a gift. They're given to us by God. They're not ours to keep. God gives each and every one of us that have kids a job. In reality, we have our Heavenly Father. But our job down here as earthly parents, we still have to go to the Heavenly Father, still in prayer, to how to raise our kids. Now kids are a gift, but they're not yours to mold. Well, wait a minute, they, while well, we're raising them, we're supposed to mold them into, you know, God-fearing children. Well, yes, that's true. But they're not ours to mold, but they're ours to unfold. Ours to unfold, to nurture, to raise in the ways of the Lord. Now, we'll go back to the beginning of the parable of the lost son. Now, the son was asking for his inheritance. Dad, I want this, I want this, I want this. You guys seen the movie, any movie of the prodigal son, you've seen different versions of it. The son's begging and asking for his, his father to give him his inheritance. His father gives it to him. But the son just gets it, leaves. And you got to remember this father, he's a wealthy man. But after the son getting his inheritance, he goes out, has a bunch of friends, very popular. It reminded me of when I had my first job at the Bisbee Breakfast Club. I was... First, I was a dishwasher. My dad called it a pearl diver. And then I ended up being a busser, picking up plates. And then I ended up being a waiter. I wasn't a waiter for very long because I couldn't, I don't know, it wasn't for me. I dropped plates. I got in trouble a lot, so they put me in the back again, washing dishes. So I did that for a little bit, but then they put me on the line to cook. So uh, my cousin Serge, he worked there too, so he's, he knows exactly what I'm talking about here. After being out of high school, you get a job, you get that paycheck, the probably like $200, $300, and man, you feel like you're rich. 
It's like, guys, cruising's on me today. Don't worry about the gas. I just got paid. So this is how that this young son felt. He had all the money, wasted it all. You know, for us parents, and again, you look at me like, Tito, your, your kids are still young. You don't know what it feels like. Yeah, I don't. But I hear other parents at work and here that talk about their kids that are off on their own. So many years a child spends with their parents and it just feels like just in a snap, in a blink of an eye, they're gone, living their own life. And all you can do is hope and pray that you raise your kids right. Because in the end, you unfold them, teach them the ways of the Lord, bring them to church. And you hope and pray because as soon as they leave the house, they have the same freedom that me and you have as parents. What God gives us is a free will. You know, I've talked to my dad a lot about this and I get the same response. It's not the response that I like. That all you can do is raise your daughters in the ways of the Lord, teach them right, and in the end, it's their decision. And that's not something I want to hear as a, as a young father. It's like, no, I want to hear that, yeah, you teach them in the ways of the Lord, they're going to keep living the ways of the Lord. They're going to stay away from all the partying, all the clubs, all the drinking, all the drugs, all of the crowds that are just not for Jesus but against Him. And it's like Mark Twain says here, anyone who's been through it will tell you parenting a teenager can be a tough job. When a boy or girl turns 13, you put him and her in a barrel. You close up the lid, seal it up, and you feed them through the knot of the hole. When he turns, when he or she turns 16, you keep him in that barrel, keep the top on, lock it up, but this time you plug that hole. And sometimes, you know, as parents, and again, I'm still a young father, and, I, and I'm going to keep this, I'm going to use this against my younger daughter, Janissa, because she already promised me that I can live with her forever. So, her husband, future husband, is going to have to live with that because she promised me already that I'm going to be there and live with her. But so you're teaching your kids the way to go. They go off college, get a job, start working. And as a parent, all you can do is sit back and hope and pray that they're not living like this prodigal son, blowing everything off. Because in reality, I'll be the first kid, first kid, I'm 30 years old. I'm still a kid to my mom and dad. But I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say that there's some things that I'm not proud of. Living alone, on my own, and doing things that if my mom and dad found out, they'd be like, we didn't teach you that. We didn't teach you that. I think all of us have the same, the same thought process too as, you know, our parents raising us and us making the, our own decisions that wouldn't make our parents very happy with that decision. So living a life of sin, it's only for a season. This prodigal son here was living wealthy, spent everything. Probably went to the best nightclubs in Vegas. They said that he brought prostitutes, had the best friends. But it says right here, in verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. Again, living a life in sin, it's only for a season. You can live your life in sin. Do the things under the radar where no one, none of your friends or your family is going to find out about. But God knows. You see, God knows two paths here. He sees from beginning to end. He sees the path, His path. If you take His path, He sees that path. I have a lot of things for you. He also sees the path if you go away from Him. He knows that path also. also. So you can live a life of, 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 of uh, sin. Have you guys seen uh, beer commercials? Those of you guys who watch the Super Bowl, there's a lot of those. But if you remember these beer commercials, what do you see on that commercial? You see a great time. You see partying, you see beaches, you see you see women in the bikinis, muscular men, and 
they're having a great time, fantastic time. Oh, and, and beers are now low calories, so you know it's even better. But they don't show the aftermath of that. They don't show what happens to an alcoholic. There's a, a man in Bisbee, ever since, ooh, ever since I was a little kid, was a drinker, big drinker. That's why from the morning all the way to the night would drink. I coached his daughter in softball, and yeah, he'd be out in the outfielder right there, and you know what he was doing, because that's what he was known as. He didn't work, his wife was the only one that worked. But from the day he woke up, every day, he started drinking, working on cars, for the night. It didn't even, you wouldn't even notice if he was drunk anymore. It was just his lifestyle, it was normal to him. Well, he was almost losing his family, so he stopped drinking. Well, he got very, very, very sick. And the doctors told him, if you stop drinking, you're gonna die. It became a part of you. You drank so much for so long that if you stop now, that's it. So that's what I mean where you see these commercials of fun, 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 but they don't show you the aftermath of what can it do, what it can do to you, all the wrecks, drunk driving wrecks. There's a few, uh, at the prison, there's a few inmates there that are there for DUIs. And the ones that I've talked to, they said that I regret drinking. I don't know why my friends did it. We did it to get girls, but it cost a life and now I'm in here to pay for it and I have to live with that. They don't show that on the commercials. That's why I say that living a life of sin, it's only for a season. You want to turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. And it goes back to this prodigal son. He got his money, his hair in his left home. Father raised him right. They were working hard kids. The younger one left, got the money, spent it on wild living, had friends, had everything. While well, that season ended. That season of living in sin ended and he ended up with nothing. So in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the, their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Numbers 32 Chapter 32, verse 23. And this is what it says. But if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord. And you may be sure that your sin will find you out. That's what I mean that sinning is only for a season. You read two verses here, scriptures, that you, you'll reap what you sow. This prodigal son lived a great, fun life. But in the end, he was left at rock bottom. Again, how many of you have been there? And be sure your sin will find you out. You know, you can be living a life of sin, knowing the gospel, and you thinking that, I can ask God, it's undercover, nobody will know, but I can ask God for forgiveness on my own time, and nobody will ever find out. Try that and see how far you go because you think the devil's going to let you go that easy. This young son had to work with the pigs. I don't know how long this, this famine was on this young man, but look at your own lives. Because we've all been there where I know this is wrong. I know what I'm doing is wrong. I know the gospel. I know if I ask for forgiveness, from my heart, God will forgive me. So let me just go to this club one last time. Let me do these drugs this one last time. Let me get drunk this one last time and have fun. And in the end, I'll, I'll ask for forgiveness. Now we're going to go to the third stage here. The first stage was he went on his own, living on his own, living a great life. Second stage here is after living a life of sin, it was only for a season. He ran out of everything and was in need. So now that's what's called hitting rock bottom. I've been there hitting rock bottom. 
here where it says that he went to get hired at a citizen of the country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Here, the pigs were considered unclean animals back then. They were considered unclean animals to the Jewish culture. So if a man was longing for food of the pigs, it was definitely considered hitting rock bottom. So this young boy hit rock bottom where he would look back at his parents I was like, I had a good, I had a great family, I was working great, and I burned everything. So the son rehearsed, 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 and rehearsed in verse 17. When he came to the census, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say this to him. Now listen, father, I have sinned against heaven. Did you notice that he said, father, I have sinned against heaven first? before asking for forgiveness from his own father. I have sinned against heaven, I have sinned against God. I have sinned against heaven, I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. He was willing to go back to his father, ask for forgiveness first from God, then from his dad, and willing to be a servant. Be one of the low class servants there that, were, that was working for his dad. He came to his senses. Before the lost sin, son of a sinner can come to God, he or she must set, must see his or own true state of slavery to sin and separation from God. Although the father longs with love and compassion for the prodigal to return home, the prodigal must change his or her mind about sin. They see where this is going. First, the prodigal was about a son. But as you read on, on the notes here, it says, he or she must see his or true state of slavery to sin and separation from God. The prodigal must change his or her own mind about sin, confess I have sinned, and, multi and humbly return to the Father to bring the prodigal or the lost to the place it is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now we'll go to the return. Who talked about living on his own? He hit rock bottom. Now the return. The father got to his son a new robe. After the father saw him, he didn't care. It seemed like the son rehearsed, rehearsed, rehearsed on how to ask for forgiveness and he didn't even get a chance to do it. The father just welcomed him in, grabbed him, hugged him, loved him because he knew his son had returned. That's how our Heavenly Father is. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. The Heavenly Father is waiting with open arms, waiting for you to come back to Him. Of course, is there consequences? So yes, there is. With sin, there are, there's always consequences. But with the Heavenly Father's help, He'll guide you through that. And you know, we talked about Father's Day last week and how I said on mine that when I was a younger kid, being with my dad, I felt like I was untouchable. Nobody could hurt me. That's how we should feel with our Heavenly Father when we come to Him after our season of sin that nothing can touch me. I'm with my Heavenly Father. I'm, I'm a child of His now. So we'll go through right here. The Father got His Son a new robe. And in getting a new robe, it signifies He restored His dignity. Can you imagine being out there after partying and everything? Working with the pigs in the dirt smelling. If you guys been to the fair and you've seen the animals, you know that stench. But this was, I can imagine, way worse. Next, the father gave the son a ring. During this time, wearing a ring was a sign of both wealth and position, meaning my son is back. He's still my son. I'm not going to hire him as a servant. He's still going to come back to his wealth and his position as my son. He's still mine. So this was the symbol that reflected the father's desire to restore his son as a family member and a respectable member of the community. But also, he put on new sandals. New sandals, which was a gesture that says, I want you around for a while. And the last gift was a big, fat, juicy calf. These types of feasts were reserved for incredibly important 
occasions. Jesus' description of the Father's response to the Son returns teaches us several important truths. The first truth is that God has compa compassion for the lost because of their sorrowful condition. Number two, God, God's love for them is so great that, we never, that He never ceases to grieve over them and to wait for their return. Number three, when sinners sincerely turn to God, God is more than ready to receive them with forgiveness, love, compassion, grace, and the full rights of children. So now, as we finish with that prodigal son, we go back and look at our own relation to the prodigal. Each and every single one of us at one time was a prodigal, lost. Lost, hitting rock bottom, nowhere to go. It goes back to, well, what do you do next? There's always a part two here with the parable. And the parable that gets overlooked, the second part here. And it's just as important. And that's with the older brother, when the son returns. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And the son answers back, why? Why should I go in? My younger brother goes out, spends everything, causes pain and hurt to you. And now you just throw a feast right then and there because he returned? What have you done for me? I didn't go against you. I didn't go against God. I served you. I worked hard. And you can't even give me a small cat for me. And sometimes here in the church, in all churches, our minds are not on God but on other people. We can be lifting our hands and praising God with our words, but our hearts aren't in it. Now I'll give you myself, I'll give myself an example here, use myself as an example. And I've used it before, and it's towards Maria, is when she got baptized in the Spirit first, speaking in tongues. She let me know she was happy, very happy, let me know. My reaction was kind of blunt. And it's like, I got mad, I got jealous. So I was like, well, why her, why, why did she get it first? And how can we get it at the same time? Or what's the deal here? It's like going back to what the prodigal son, the older son, he got mad. And it goes towards even siblings. We have siblings maybe that are not saved, and you yourself are saved, and the parents seem to pay attention more to them than to you. So it's like, I'm not doing nothing wrong here, but yeah, you pay more attention to them. So what do we do when we have a, lot, a prodigal son or a daughter? Not just a son or a daughter, but anybody in the family. A co-worker, a tío, a tía, cousins, whatever it may be. How, how do you deal with a prodigal? There's only one word for that, and that's love. Love. I know for people online watching, or maybe some of you here, you've had a, a child that became a prodigal, went away from home, who knows what they did, drugs, partying, drinking. You sit there and you wonder, what's going on, what do I do? I pray and pray and pray and pray. But still show them love. Well, of course, I mean, you don't know my, what I've been through, Tito. I mean, my son, my daughter, I brought them back in. I brought my husband or my wife that was lost. I brought them back in, and yet they, they just steal and leave again. They tell me that they're done, but they're not really done. They just leave again. They just want money or just want somewhere to stay for the night and then go back to where they're at now. Well, I didn't say that, you know, you got to love them and let them keep doing that. There has to be rules and boundaries, of course. But still showing love and compassion, just like the Lord does for each and every one of us when we were once prodigals, that's how you deal with a prodigal son or a daughter or anybody that was lost. In the Bible, the older son represents the Pharisees who outwardly keep God's commands, but inwardly have a prideful religious and judgment spirit. That's what that second son represented. 
So again, we look at our own lives as prodigals. Where were you at before you knew Christ? And you know, with my dad and me, I'll use myself as, as an example again. And it's going to sound weird, but it feels weird saying I love you to my dad. It's like a, a, a very strong man that raised me, that I saw as Superman and, and everything. And my mom, I have no problem saying I love you. It's, she, was, she, she was a comforter. But you know, to my dad, it's, I love you. And sometimes when I say back, I love you, it's like... But send those kids or family members that are lost, that are still prodigals. There's nothing wrong with that I love you text with your kids. Something that I learned and even my own daughters pointed it out to me. You want to know what my worst enemy is when I'm around my kids? My worst enemy is this. My phone. Even if I'm using it to listen to a sermon or listening to Christian music Sometimes my daughters, Yvette or Janice, they'll tell me, Dad, get off the phone. And I even see them now. If you give a kid a phone and tell them to take a picture, I mean, if you, give, if you tell them to take a picture, back in the day before the phones, what was the gesture? It was this. Now, tell a kid, take a picture of me. Pretend, what do you do? Selfie, whatever it may be, they watch us. They watch us, and, and that's one thing that I promised my daughters. It was last Monday. And I told them, when I'm with you guys, let me know if I'm on my phone. I'll put it away. We set up a, a, a movie theater at the house, at my mom's house. We had a, a, a movie theater night. I, I felt like a kid again. It was, it was great. We got the, all the chairs and everything. And we put them against the sofa. We've got big blankets. And we put it on top. And we had just one big dark little fort over the TV and we laid in there. I couldn't fit in there, but I was watching from the outside. But there was that moment where I was like, wow, you know, this is, this is what I've been missing and my kids are still little. I can still, I still have time. I think it was Pastor Baracas that said, that was talking last week when it was Father's Day, the importance, the impact that we have on our kids. What you do, what you say, how you act. They're watching. That doesn't mean that our kids are going to be perfect. Like I told you earlier when I was preparing my sermon, I was preparing for a perfect sermon, which is not possible. I need to understand that God is going to use me. I'm not here to please you guys. I'm here to please God. And that's what I realized with my kids too, is that I need to be available. I need to be available. There's no perfect kids. There's not. There's, we're all going to have, those of us that have young kids, we're all going to have our troubles. And that's why it's so important that us, as a church, the men's group, the women's group, is so important because we can go to each other. I can go to Carl. I can go to Gilbert, Pastor Barajas. They have kids that already have careers, have children. And I can go to them for future references and be like, hey, my kids are, maybe they're going to start doing this and this. So, I mean, pray with me, help me here. All we can do is unfold our kids, raise them in the way of the Lord. And when it's time for them to go and be on their own, you just pray that what you stalled in them, what you taught them, how they saw you every day, you just pray that they make the right decisions. Again, there's no perfect kids. Kids mess up. I've messed up. We've all messed up. But just like the prodigal son, if our kids get lost, and when, not if, when they come back to Christ, you're going to welcome them in with open arms just like the father did. That's why when we see the prodigal son here, it's not about what I said earlier to encourage parents about rebellious kids. It's not just about kids, it's about every one of us. When we drift away, get lost, the first thing is coming to the Father, asking for forgiveness, and then later on, 
asking whoever else you've hurt. So again, there's nothing wrong with sending your kids and I love you text, calling just to say I love you. Like I said, it's, I do, I say I love you to my dad, but it's like saying I love you to a very, for me, a masculine, strong man, where it's like, yeah, we're too macho for this right now. But I still remember all the time, all the time, after my phone calls with my mom or my dad, there's always an I love you. Don't forget that. Always tell your kids, I love you. Phone call, text, keep them in the loop. No matter how old your kids get, and I can't speak from experience because I still go to my parents. No matter how old they get, they're still going to need their mom and dad. They're still going to come to you guys. And what are you going to do? Turn them around saying, well, we need to take it to, our, to both our fathers. So as we close, we'll pray, we'll dismiss online, and then these altars will be open. If you know anybody that's still a prodigal, doesn't have to be a kid, anybody, family member, friends, co-worker, come up to the altar, stand in place, stand in the place for them, pray for them. And hey, if you're one of those that have drifted away from God and you want to come back and say, I've messed up, I've been drifting away from God. I need prayer. Day's coming and it's coming fast. Could be right when we walk out of these doors, could be five minutes from now where the Lord comes and gets His people. Prayer is something so powerful that I, I don't think, I think we underestimate it. You pray and pray and pray. God has His timing, perfect timing. So I know every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, oh God, how we love you. We just want to thank you, Lord, for this day. Another day. Every day, Lord, is a blessing. And Lord, we should all see it as it's another day to correct my ways, to be more like you. It's another day, Lord, that you can use me for any prodigal, prodigal person out there that's lost, that's maybe went away from you. Father, you've spoken to each and every one of us. And Lord, as we leave today, we just ask that we leave differently than how we came in. Let us see things differently, Lord. Just like the father and the prodigal son welcomed his son with open arms, without question. And through a big feast, Lord, that's how you see us. You just ask us to come back where we left off. You walk with us throughout our whole life. And sometimes we get distracted and we take a wrong turn. And Lord, you stop and look at us and wait and wait and wait until we choose to turn around and come back and say, Father, I've messed up again. And without question, without God questioning, saying, well, you messed up. I can't take you back. No. He says, come on, my son, my daughter. We're going to start again. I, I've been here waiting for you with my arms open wide. We're going to correct it all. But this time, look to me. Don't look around. Seek my face. Walk in my steps. And I will guide you through everything and all things. Just trust me. Oh, we just pray that we have a great week. Be with each and every one of us. And Lord, we just want to thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.